Welcome back to Beyond the Uniform. I'm Justin Asiri, and my goal is to help members of the military and their families thrive in their civilian career. Today's episode number 309 with Ken Coleman. And passion is not enough. Because if you just pursue your passion, you're not actually any good at it. You're going to end up like the kid on American Idol that we all make fun of. (laughs) Who's passionate about being famous or passionate about music, but they suck or they're just okay. And they're okay in their little world, in their gymnasium, in front of their, you know, little gatherings in high school. But when it comes time to perform in front of world-class producers and be considered to be one of the best musicians in America, they don't have quite what it takes. And then they're dumbfounded and confused and upset and all this kind of stuff. And it's because they didn't have any people around and say, hey, let's, let's, let's look at what your sweet spot really is. Well, longtime listeners know that usually on the show, I have on military veterans to talk about their career path and advice for others seeking to do the same. Today is a skills episode where I meet with a non-veteran who I think has a lot of knowledge who can help out listeners regardless of their desired career path. And my guest today has a ton of information to share. He is uh, the author of best-selling book. He is also the host of a national uh, radio show where literally people call in from all different backgrounds to ask them about how they can find a career that they will love. And the reason why we're talking today is because I've heard military guests on the show and heard the advice he gave and knew that I wanted to broadcast that advice further. Um, As always at beyondtheuniform.org, you'll find show notes for this episode with links to everything we discuss. And as a deviation um, to normal episodes, If you stick around after the show, um, I'll spitball a couple things that stood out to me from this episode. Uh, We had a very short amount of time, and so I didn't want to, I didn't have enough time to kind of chime in on some thoughts that came up for me. So if you're interested in that and, and diving a little bit deeper on this episode, stick around afterwards. So with that, let's dive in to my conversation with Ken Coleman. Well, joining me today in Franklin, Tennessee, my guest is Ken Coleman. Ken, welcome to Beyond the Uniform. Well, I'm thrilled to be with you, Justin. I love your work. You're a great American. Thank you. Well, I want to give listeners, first of all, a little bit of background on Ken and then a little bit of context for how we were connected. So Ken is a career expert. He is the best-selling author of The Proximity Principle and national radio host of The Ken Coleman Show. Pull in from his own personal struggles, missed opportunities, and career successes, Coleman helps people discover what they were born to do and provides practical steps to make their dream job a reality. The Ken Coleman Show is a caller-driven career show that helps listeners who are stuck in their job and uh, in a job they hate or are searching for something more out of their career. He's also the author of One Question, Life-Changing Answers from Today's Leading Voices. Uh, He is also a frequent guest host for The Dave Ramsey Show, which is the third largest nationally syndicated talk show radio in America. Uh, And for listeners, the way that we were connected is one of the listeners from Beyond the Uniform listens to Ken's show, heard him meeting with a veteran on air, which he does frequently, and we realized there's so much overlap here, we really wanted to get him on the show. And so, Ken, maybe to start things off, um, it's very clear in your podcast that you have a passion for helping the veteran community. Um, Where does that passion come from? Well, certainly my love of America. I think if you love your country, and and I was raised in a house where uh, love of country was a big deal and it mattered. And I think that uh, the reason I'm so passionate about veterans is the same reason that uh, you go to any sporting venue in America today and uh, a veteran walks out on the field and everybody stands up and applauds. It's a sustained innovation. So for the men and women who are willing to sign up and say, I'm willing to put my life on the line, for the liberty of my nation, my fellow brothers and sisters. Um, I don't know that you can command a higher respect. So that's why I'm passionate about veterans. And, and I'll tell you, I'm also passionate about helping veterans because I have heard time and time again on my show through an um, active military or somebody who's uh, retired and has yet to kind of find their role in the private sector. They've served our nation so honorably and are serving our nation so honorably. And so skillfully, I might add. And when they call me and say, Ken, I, I'm getting out three or four years, and I mean, I'm, just, I'm having the hardest time figuring out how am I going to fit it? Mm-hmm. And uh, it breaks my heart, first of all, and then it fires my soul. 
And the reason it fires my soul is because I can't wait for them to stop talking so I can say, hey, if you're a leader in the military, you can lead in business. You can lead in a nonprofit. You can lead in a ministry. If you're in logistics in the military, you can do logistics in the private sector. If, if you are in communications in the military, you can do it in the private sector. And I think the message I want those folks who call me and your audience to hear, if you're feeling that same thing, and I suspect there are many that are, is that you are working for one of the greatest organizations the world has ever known. Hmm. Okay, now that's not a political statement. That's a fact. And you need to understand that the same dynamic that is going on in the heads and hearts of people when, when you are watching on TV or you were in a sports venue and they honor a man or woman from the military and everybody stands up and claps and shows high esteem, that mindset is also in the minds of people who will want to hire you. It's not like they've got a separate mindset when they go to the football game. Mm. When you apply, they're going to go, I respect this person. Mm. So it's really interesting to me, Justin. I haven't quite figured out why there's a disconnect there. Because when I just gave you that analogy, that metaphor, and kind of brought it all together, how is it they respect you at a football game and they're not going to respect you when you apply for a job? I'm not quite sure where the disconnect is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I suspect it might be because you've only known one thing, and that's the military, and you feel like it's such a different world and such a different environment that the worlds can't coexist. And I'm out there to dispel that myth. So uh, mm -hmm. I'm already preaching first question in, but I think it's really important that your audience understand that. You work for one of the finest organizations the world has ever seen. And if you can do it well there, you can do it well out here with the rest of us. And by the way, we'd be thrilled to have you. It's hard <laughs> to stand beside you. I love that. I, I, I think that part of where it comes from is, um, and this comes up, this is you know 300 plus interviews. So many veterans, when they leave the military, they don't, they don't know what they want to do on the other side. They don't even know what options are available often. Right. That's, that's a driving force behind this show is my own experience in the military, not knowing what I would do afterwards. And um, I think it's compounded because most of the people I know who serve, they're so, they're so passionate about serving. It gives their life so much purpose. And then when they get to the other side, they're lacking that strong cause, that strong purpose, that strong identity. Mm -hmm. And so one of the most common questions I get that I would love your thoughts on is how to discover what their next mission is, how to discover what their next passion is. And I'll, I'll caveat that by saying that personally, I don't believe that that necessarily needs to be their job. Maybe they're passionate about helping their community or being there for their family. Like, I don't think that their job needs to define them. But I think for many of us, our job plays a big role in our identity. And any advice about um, how to sift through the rubble and figure out what might be their next calling? Yeah, a couple of things. What I teach on my show works for a man or woman in the military just as much as it works for somebody outside. And you just said something that just really made me think. And, and this is that my work doesn't define me. No, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. However, your work life is a massive part of your life. Mm -hmm. The average American is going to spend 90,000 plus hours at work in their lifetime. That is staggering. Mm -hmm. And there is also a intrinsic connection between the work you do and the life you live, meaning that we all want to matter. Every call that calls into my show basically says, I just want to help you. Mm. And I usually make a little side kind of out of my mouth comment, well, welcome to the human race. That's not passion. That's you desire to matter. I start off every show, Justin, with this statement. Every man and woman on the planet was created to fill a unique role. Mm. That means that role and you are needed. Mm -hmm. But that also means that you have a duty to fulfill it. Now, when we say duty to your audience, <laughs> that word matters. Yeah. Duty is a lost word, if you think about it, in our culture as a whole. But when I say duty to your audience, that is a word. Mm -hmm. And you said something earlier that you gave me some tremendous insight. Now, I do now understand why that those military men and women feel that way because they see a super clear connection between their work and meaning. 
Yes. I'm serving my fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. Fill it. Country. It. Yeah. Country. Yeah. And so there is the tremendous meaning. Mm -hmm. And so they feel like, oh, when I step out of this role, I have no purpose. Oh my gosh. So here's what we did. Let's look at your unique role. How do we do that? So your unique role is not that much different per se than maybe what you were doing in the military. Now, you might have not been doing work you love, but work you were good at, but you kind of got over the passion thing because you had some meaning mm -hmm. with that whole, I'm serving my country. But everybody else needs that passion with talent. Passion's not enough. Talent's not enough. It's the intersection of the two. You got to use what you do best to do what you love to do most. So how do you do that? You begin to assess what are my primary talents, things that I've just always been good at. People compliment me on these things. I know that I'm very proficient, very gifted at, at, at making these things happen. I'm just, I'm good at it. And then we look at, well, what work makes me come alive? The role, the function, the task itself, that also creates a result that brings you tremendous satisfaction because of the joy that it gives you. Because you know that it matters. It's well done, and you see a result to the work you do. So this exercise can be done for military men and women as well, just like my audience, okay? And, and so the idea is we got to figure out before we leave the military, what is our sweet spot? And, and within the sweet spot are multiple career paths, multiple jobs, multiple ways that you can achieve the meaning. We're just looking at the clarity of that construct, which is as long as I'm using what I do best to do something that matters a great deal to me, I'm in the sweet spot. Mm -hmm. And so you begin to get clues by what you do best. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I'll tell you, I'll give you, I'll walk you through this with a recent call. So I had a, a, a lady who's in the military. She's going to get out in about four years and she kind of had the same feeling. I said, well, what do you do best? She goes, well, I'm really, really good uh, at logistics planning. Uh, I, I love being a part kind of a support role all the time where I'm communicating with multiple people. I said, are you good at communicating? She goes, yeah, I'm pretty good. At I'm really pretty good. I said, great. And so we walked her through all the things that she's really good at. And then I said, okay, now what are some clues in that list of what you're talented at, what your strengths are? How many of those things, when you look at that list, do you actually go, I like doing that as well? She goes, oh, I love being a part of planning and operations and seeing the mission executed. I said, wait a second. You're telling me that, you're really, really good at details and logistics and supporting people and communicating and kind of getting everything, everybody on the same page and kind of helping move that ball down the field so that it gets executed. You're telling me you're really good at that? She starts giggling because she knows I'm leading her to a corner. And she said, yes. And I said, and you're telling me you like doing those things? Like it really gives you juice when a project or mission is accomplished well? She goes, yeah. And I go, I wonder if that's valuable in the private sector. She starts laughing. I said, I wonder how many companies right now in an economy where we have more jobs available than we have people who are unemployed. By the way, uh, I think there's like 3.7 million people, roughly, I saw an article this week, uh, that are unemployed. Though There's 1.4 more, 1.4 million more jobs available. And you're telling me that as a, honorable, honorably uh, serving a uh, man or woman in the military, you know what you like to do and you're really good at it. And you're telling me that a person of your talents and passions isn't going to be valuable in all kinds of industries. Pick the industry. It doesn't even matter what the industry is. Those roles are everywhere. In fact, the world's economy largely revolves around this lady, people mm -hmm. like her that are doing that role. And, and, and so I know I'm excitable here, folks, but I mean, it's, it, 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 it blew her mind. Like she, she hung up that phone and you could hear it in her voice. Mm. Total confidence. Why? Because of clarity. Mm. And so, you know, the bottom line is, is that when anybody walks through my sweet spot exercise on the air or does it with themselves and then goes get feedback from people so we know we're not delusional or truly self-aware, um, you get clarity, Justin, and when you get clarity, you get confidence, confidence to step forward, step out, step from the military into the private sector. And here's the best part, the third C, courage to stay the path, mm. because you can always retreat back to clarity. I know this is in my sweet spot. I know I've got the talent to pull this off. 
I know it gives me the juice to stay with it. And that's how we can step in on the dream job. I, I love that in particular because I feel like our, our audience, I feel like people who serve, once they have clarity, they're unstoppable. Once they know where the mission is, they will break through walls to obtain it. And I think we often get tripped up on that clarity. But I love what you said about that intersection of, of passion and talent. There's lots of things that I love and I don't really have a natural ability. So great. That's a good hobby for me. It might not Perfect. be a good career That's path. Exactly right. But I love that honest assessment. And, and I imagine this changes over time too, of like, where does my passion lie and where does my talent lie? And I also love how you were explicit on this universal desire for meaning, for mattering, for contribution. I hope that that helps listeners realize they're, they're not alone in this. You know, you, you may be more fortunate than most people in society and that you found your first career that gave you meaning. The military gave you a lot of meaning and know that everyone is driving for that and you can find that again out of the uniform. Um, I, I wanted to ask, and I think this will relate, but your most recent book, uh, the best-selling book, The Proximity Principle, could you talk a little bit about what that is? And I, I think that will kind of play into our discussion here too. Yeah, The Proximity Principle simply says that in order to do what you want to do, You've got to be around people who are doing it and in places where it is happening. Mm. So now you extrapolate two words from that sentence. You got people and places. And here's the formula for success. And not just success, significance mm. over a long period of time. The right people plus the right places equals opportunity. Now you think about that because that's what everybody's longing for. Uh, one of my heroes is Thomas Jefferson, and we all have at some point recited or memorized the Declaration of Independence, and the most famous line from the Declaration of Independence is where he says, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yeah. What does he mean? What is Jefferson saying when he says the pursuit of happiness? What he's saying is the opportunity to pursue it. He's talking about all this, he's about life. That's a core right. Liberty, which is freedom. And it's interesting that he takes life and freedom. And the third one is pursuit of happiness. Now, what you don't realize, many people don't. I'm a history geek, and I know that's becoming very, very obvious. Uh, he was influenced by great writers like John Locke, who was influenced by the Greeks, the Greek philosophers. And the Greek word, uh, for happiness basically means the pursuit of doing something worthy. That's how they define happiness, mm -hmm. which I look at that and I go, that's what I mean when I talk about purpose, the mm -hmm. sweet spot. It's not about a happy feeling. It's about a feeling of significance that I'm doing work that matters to me because I see how it matters to others. So, Back to this idea, how do I get where I want to go in my career, whether I'm in the military or not in the military? you got to use the proximity principle. We have made the journey up to the mountain, the dream job, up the mountain. We've made it way too difficult, way too mystical. You know, it's, oh, it's just, oh, i got to be in the right place at the right time. No. It's all about being around the right people in the right places. When I'm around the right people, guess what happens? I learn what I need to learn, mm -hmm. right? I meet who I need to meet. They connect me with other right people. They tell me the places that I need to be in. And when I get in those right places, guess what? There's lots of right people in those right places. And all of a sudden, it becomes a cycle of intentionality. And if you are in proximity to the people who are doing what you eventually want to do, and you're in, the, and you're in proximity to the places where the work you want to do is happening, I'm telling you right now, you will never want for opportunity. It'd be like you stepped in a train station. Now, I don't know when that train of opportunity is going to show up, but it is going to show up. Here's what I know. Remember that little phrase? Oh, he was in the right place at the right time, which just speaks to dumb luck. I hate it. I'd like to delete it from our cultural vernacular. And I'd rather people say, if you're in the right place, the right time will happen. Mm. Only if you're in the right place. And, and, and that's been true of my career and countless careers of men and women who are successful. They got in the right place. They got around the right people. And then opportunity showed up, knocked on the door. 
So that's the proximity principle in a nutshell. Of course, as you know, you got five people, archetypes, five places in the book. It's a very practical guide that puts you on the path, a clear path to doing work you love. I, I think that's great because in so many of the interviews I've done, I hear that. I hear that, it, you know, I, I am a big fan of the phrase, the harder I work, the luckier I am. And oftentimes, veteran guests on the show will talk about, you know, that it was one person they met that led to the career, the, the career changing decision or the new job or whatever else. And I think if we were to unpack that, we would realize that they were having hundreds of coffee chats. They were going to conferences. They were surrounding themselves, like you said, with the people and the places that matter. And it seems like that's really driven by clarity. Once you have clarity, you can start to define who are the people and the places that are significant to this intended path for my life, and then having those conversations. And for listeners who may be on a ship right now or overseas, you know, places, it, it is the best time in the, in the history of our species when it comes to places because you can set up a video call, you can set up a phone call. Even if you're stationed in Afghanistan right now, you can reach out to an investment banker in New York and have a call with them. You can still connect with those people even if you're geographically separated. So I love the simplicity of that message, Ken. It's amazing to just kind of boil us down to people in places that makes it much more, I think, achievable for a lot of listeners. Well, that's exactly right. That's why I wrote the book. Mm -hmm. You know, that little principle, as I stated, it came to me in the car one day driving into the office as I was looking back on my journey. Mm -hmm. It's not easy to get into broadcasting. Certainly when you don't have a degree in it, you don't know a lot of people. And by the way, when you start at 31 and you drag your feet for about three years, so really 34 is when I started kind of, it's where we pick up in that first chapter and I take people to my patio. And I'm having a pity party. I'm like the human Eeyore, you know. Mm -hmm. And I got sick and tired of moping around. And um, it, it, it was a game changer for me because it was less intimidating, you know, and these are bite size actions every day. And again, it, it's, it's compoundable. Like we've all seen a basic interest. Like when you say we've all seen this, whether we were in elementary school or we've seen it, you know, the, the power of investing a small amount of money early on and continuing to invest. And this is the same thing. You know, if I am investing my time, by being around the right people and being in the right places, the return on that is going to be phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And it takes time though. This is not an overnight deal, but I want people to understand you can identify the right people. And you know this, here's what I'm talking about. I'm bringing in these archetypes in the book. If you think about the professional, which is the person you could never have lunch or coffee, most likely, but you don't need to. I learned how to be an interviewer by watching every Larry King live episode that has ever been on television. Mm. I can learn from afar in 2019. I've got podcasts, which are free. I've got books, which are really cheap on Amazon. Hello. Right. They sell my book right now for half off. <laughs> you know, um, and oh, by the way, I get emails and social media posts. People get my book from the library. So I don't want to hear any excuses. Webinars, YouTube, conferences so the idea of learning from the best of the best in your field uh it ought to be so right in front of your face and i can learn from the greats while i then try to get around the professor who can teach me the fundamentals and i can have lunch and coffee with high level producers in my zip code who are winning in that field but they're much more accessible because i probably know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who will vouch for me. And, and, and then I can always surround myself with better people in my life. Those are the peers. And then, of course, mentors are there. Mm -hmm. so i got to be intentional. i got to make that time count. So, again, I love what you pointed out. The proximity principle blows the, blows the, uh, the myth apart. It's not this crazy, scary, fantastical journey that only a few fortunate souls make. Mm -hmm. And I, I think what, what comes up for me when you say all that, too, is the importance of clarity. I think one of the phrases that veterans are known for, which I wish I could delete from the lexicon, is um, I'm, a, I'm a Swiss Army knife. I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything. And what the problem I see with that is it removes the clarity 
where you're not precise in the people you're around and the places that you're going. And in Ken's example, like you wanted to be in broadcast media. That's very specific. You could look at Larry King. You could specifically study him. But if you were just saying, hey, I'll do anything, where are you going for your people? Where are you going for your, your places? It lacks that precision that's going to allow you to, like I love that analogy, use it, compound that knowledge over time and build up that defined skill set. And, and that kind of leads into one of the things I wanted to ask you about is um, uh, author Cal Newport. We had him on the show in episode 86. He wrote a book that's called So Good They Can't Ignore You. And one of the things that stood out to me from that advice is um, he, he talks about uh, – you know, saying follow your passion can be difficult versus this craftsman mindset, which is building up a skill set. And I'm wondering if you have a point of view around that, because I, I also like what you're saying about this intersection of passion and talent. So how would you advise people to view their passion or having their passion influence where they lead their career? Well, passion is one part of the equation that I already shared. So mm -hmm. I would agree with Cal. Uh, I've interviewed Cal a couple of times, so I know Cal. I would agree with him and anybody who says this, but they take a cultural phrase and they poo-poo it because they're thought leaders. And that's fine. Yeah. Because if Cal's saying that the advice shouldn't be follow your passion, he's right. Mm. Because I don't say follow your passion. What I say is get in your sweet spot mm. and find that unique role that you were meant to play. Uh, and, well, and what we do is we use passion as an indicator. Right? So, again, I love that you bring this up because I'd love to address this. Mm -hmm. Don't follow your passion. Figure out what you do best. Figure out what you love to do most. And discover all the different ways that you can use what you do best, talent, yep. to do what you love to do most. And he says, well, be a craftsman. Well, guess what craftsmen are? They are living, breathing examples of operating in your sweet spot. Mm. Because any craftsman will tell you that while they're very talented at woodworking, okay, or being a blacksmith or a glass blower. Oh my gosh, you've seen this new show on Netflix with all these people that are uh, blowing glass and creating <laughs> unbelievable things out of glass. I don't know if you've ever seen, have you ever seen anybody do this before? I've seen it, I've seen it live, yeah, it's incredible. I've seen it live before as well. Yeah. And uh, so these are people are craftsmen. Well, yes, they're good at what they do. They have these amazing talents to do intricate woodwork or you know, whatever, the, whatever the craft is. They're really, really good at it. But they also love, they love the actual work itself. They love it. They are okay spending five hours on one leg of furniture. Why? Because they also love the result. And that's what I told your audience earlier. So Cal's right. Cal's just not in the same space that I'm in. He's not thinking about it like I am all the time. Mm -hmm. So I want people to understand, don't ignore your passion or else you're going to call my show at 45 going, I'm really good at my job, but I hate going into work and I'm actually making really good money. We just saw an article uh, last week about an onslaught of executives making seven figures, let that sink in for a moment, and they're miserable. Mm. And I'm going to tell you why, Justin, because there's no passion for the work. Sure, they're good at it. So talent is not enough and passion is not enough. Because if you just pursue your passion, you're not actually any good at it. You're going to end up like the kid on American Idol that we all make fun of. <laughs> Who's passionate about being famous or passionate about music, but they suck. Or they're just okay. And they're okay in their little world, in their gymnasium, in front of their you know, little gatherings at high school. But when it comes time to perform in front of world-class producers and be considered to be one of the best musicians in America, they don't have quite what it takes. And then they're dumbfounded and confused and upset and all this kind of stuff. And it's because they didn't have any people around them say, hey, let's, let's, let's look at what your sweet spot really is. So that's how I would address what, what Cal said. We agree. He just didn't give a full explanation of why he says that. Because you can't be a craftsman and, and, and not be in your sweet spot. In fact, I would challenge your audience or anybody in the world to prove me wrong on that. Mm -hmm. Go find a true craftsman, somebody that would call themselves a craftsman and and ask them if they if they don't love their work you won't find it you will not find it i think that's great i think that's such a good i think they do go hand in hand like that and and one thing that came up while you were saying that is um do, do you ever find people because i love your thought of of sweet spot mm -hmm. 
do you ever find anyone where that passion or that sweet spot is almost like superficial and they haven't dug deeper. And I'm thinking of you know, like the, the American Idol example you gave is what made me think of this. It's maybe someone says like, hey, I want to be a rock star. And it's like because they envision the rock star as the 0.0001% who are at the top of their game. But if, you know, if you put them in an average bar playing to 50 people, which might be a good outcome for a rock star, that's, they're like, oh, I don't want that. No, I want the fame and the fortune. And right. it seems like it's almost like this superficial layer that hasn't been div dived in deeply to like, what is actually the thing that you're going yeah. after? And, and I guess why I'm asking this is just any advice you have on, you know, kicking the tires to make sure that people aren't defining this too, too superficially. Yeah, well, you make a very good point. Is it from the heart level or the head level? And the example you just gave, the American Idol example, is it's all head level. Mm -hmm. They just want to be famous. Yeah. They don't love the crap. They just don't love the crap. So they're going, oh, I want to be famous because I see money. I see fame. I see influence. I see all the trappings of all that. And I go, oh, I want to be that. And I'm kind of good at singing and they haven't truly done the sweet spot exercise to your point. They haven't gone deep. Mm. I've said this on the show before and I actually really believe this. And I, and I, I think that some people are going to tilt their head a little bit on this and that's okay. But I think if your why doesn't make you cry, it's not your why. So when you really get to the three core questions that I ask my listeners every day when they're trying to figure out passion, I say, who do you most want to help? What problem do you most want to solve? What solution do you most want to provide? And when you begin to envision that, and I'll tell you what I love. I love seeing the youngster who's uh, my, wife, my wife and kids. We love America's Got Talent. It's like our summertime thing. It's like our family thing. We all get around with all of it. And I've seen 17, 18, 19, 20, 21 year olds go on there and sing and then they hear that they're really really good and simon tells them and they break they just cry and it is not a cry i'm gonna be famous oh my gosh no it's you're really really good at this and you've got a tremendous future doing this and they are getting affirmation for the thing that moves their heart deeply and you can see it it's the smell test you can see the kid that just wants to be famous or you can see the kid or the adult who really loves the craft and who loves the output of it. You can see it. You can just see it. And so if you've got somebody who, who uh, is a slight bit delusional, meaning in their head they want to do this, but it doesn't move their heart, that's always going to be exposed. And they may have the talent to pursue music, but the first couple times they get rejected, they're going to quit. But let me tell you who's not going to quit the Ken Coleman's of the world who got rejected over and over again while raising three kids, mm. running my own business, dealing with severe doubt. Am I delusional? But my heart kept me in the game. Now that's passion. And uh, you know, you can take this however you want to. I'm not ashamed of this. In fact, I'm getting bolder and bolder and bolder with this. The first time it happened, Justin, I thought, Oh my gosh, is anybody going to respect me? Anymore? And then it's happened about three times, I think, in the last year and a half. And Mackenzie's sitting here. I think she's been in meetings where it's happened. There are times where I'll be in a meeting with a room full of people, and I'm talking about the work and the audience, and I get choked up. Now, that's what I'm talking about. Why am I getting choked up? I'm getting choked up because in those moments, I realize that I'm getting to help the people I most want to help. And I can't believe I'm getting to do that. And it's so rewarding, it chokes me up. If your why doesn't make you cry, it's not your why. And I don't mean walking around crying all the time and you know being this emotional mess, but it means that much to you that you are so fulfilled, you just are overjoyed. And those are tears of joy when that happens. Because I've worked so hard and so long to get to this place. And it's about the results of the work. Mm -hmm. That's all it's about. That's what should move your heart. 
I, I think that's such a great lesson. And I, particularly for our audience, my, my experience and in having interviewed 300 veterans, I, I feel like many of us, not all of us, but many of us through training or maybe just through natural, the way we are, we just live in our head. And I think that we can approach our career from that head mindset. Well, it's a good salary. It looks good on paper. It seems like people respect this job. And so I love that you're bringing this deeper into this emotional level of like, what is that cause or purpose or, or that next thing that moves your heart to the point of tears? And that to me, that to me seems like truth, like that heart that quivers at the idea of what this true purpose is, that, that is bedrock. That is truth. There is something there. And I love your pointing out the American Idol example, because my, my impression there, or America's Got Talent, my impression is they are not crying because they're thinking of the dollar signs. They're not crying because they're thinking of their name on a billboard. They're crying because they have devoted themselves to a craft and they're being seen as a true master of their, of their trade. And how I can see how that would really strike and resonate in a way that just connects with them regardless of the financial outcome. And, and I'm wondering, um, you know, you talk a lot about six stages of self-discovery and things like this. Do you have any advice on how to get past the head, how to get into the heart, how to find yeah. and to be honest about what really moves someone? Yeah, and it's, and it's, it's allowing your heart to feel and override your brain. This is the process. Those three questions I mentioned is the start. And I'd recommend that you get quiet. I mean, quiet, quiet. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like you can't hear anything but a bird chirping or a cricket. And I get out a pencil and a piece of paper and I would answer these questions. Who is it that I most want to help? And by the way, when you answer it, describe them like it was a creative writing exercise in the sixth grade. You know, describe what's, what's going on, what's their challenge? Um, and then the second question is, what problem do I most want to solve? Get super specific on the problem. And the third question is, what solution do I most want to provide? Get super specific. You, what you're going to see is the answers to question two and three are really interconnected and sometimes almost feel the same. Don't let that stop you because here's what I'm doing. I'm trying to get your brain to shut up. And this exercise works and your heart begins to reveal things. And when your brain actually sees what your heart is revealing, and this is the writing part that sees it. Your brain starts to now is a puristic kind of a, just, it's a lens, not a voice. It's a lens. And then when you've written those three answers as specifically as you can, I want you to ask one more question right now and say, why? Mm. Why did, why are those the answers? And I do this on the phone with people and you're always going to see that there's a direct connection from your story. Always. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget a guy called early on in the show. He said, Ken, I'm at a crossroads in my career and I'm confused with what's going on. I got two clear choices. I think both are my sweet spot. I need your help. I said, okay, great. Uh, he said, the first one is uh, being in IT. I'm really good at computers and I really enjoy technology. And that's a really nice career path. I can make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, what's number two? He said, number two is child psychiatry. And I instantly knew that that's the one I needed to dig into. And I said, tell me why you want to do psychiatry work with children. And he began to weep. And I mean like, chest heaving weeping couldn't even answer me. and i encouraged him i said it's okay man he's like sorry I'm like, no, 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 no. i want to know why this emotion because the answer to this emotion is the answer to why child the children that you want to help and he began to say i was abused sexually as a, as a, as a boy mm. and but but he wasn't ashamed he's sharing this on national radio mm. why because he was ready to say i was a victim I'll always be a victim, but I've overcome it. And not only have I overcome it, I want to help other kids who go through this tremendously traumatic evil. I don't want to help them get through it because somebody helped me. And that's what he basically said while, you know, basically convulsing in tears. Mm -hmm. 
So there's always a heart connection to the why question. And that's what I mean by that's how you go deep. So that's the answer to the question. That's how you get down and you get past the brain. Because by the way, real quick, Eastern, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, what is, yeah, it's one to three Eastern, yeah. Uh, and, and just just call in. And and I'm there. And I'll talk to you. And I'll help you. Thank you, Ken. I appreciate your generosity in joining us today and all the work that you do to support our military community. Thanks, brother. I appreciate you. Thanks for having me. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Thank you so much for listening. I want to take a second to delve into the last thing that Ken was talking about because we ran out of time here. Um, I really love these three questions. Who is the most, uh, who is it I most want to help? What problem do I most want to solve? And what solution do I most want to provide? And I really want to underscore and augment what Ken had said. I underscore what he's saying about the need for silence, the need for stillness in really delving into this. Um, I'm a big advocate of mindfulness or meditation. I think that that is one way that, you know, prior to doing this writing exercise, if you had 10 or even 20 minutes to sit in stillness, to just kind of focus on your breath as kind of thoughts come in to let them go and to really slow down. I think we move so quickly nowadays to start to slow down, to start to let all the to-do lists, all the planning uh, slip aside. It's almost like if you imagine a pond where someone's gone in and walked around and all the sediment has been uh, brought up and it's this murky pond. You just want to Give yourself some room to let that sediment sink to the bottom to return that pond to that crystal clearness. I think that that 20 minutes leading in to your writing exercise would go a long way. I'd also really encourage you to turn your phone off, to give yourself the 20, 30 minutes, an hour, two hours to, to really... You know, this is such foundational questions. It's going to really give you the clarity that plays such a big role in your career decision. Honor that by giving yourself some space. When I do these sorts of things, I love to get outside. There's a park nearby where I live. I actually like to go there and sit on a park bench and bring a notepad and a pen and physically write it out, be device-free, to be out in nature. But also I think it helps to be out of your normal day-to-day -day environment, out of um, you know where there might be interruptions or out, you know just kind of uh, because you're trying to look at these questions in a different light, I think it helps to get out of your normal day-to-day -day environment. And then the last um, couple things I would say on this is I would encourage you for each of those questions to use a timer and just think for a second of how long you would need to answer who is it I most want to help what, two or three minutes maybe? Whatever answer you come up with, I, I would really encourage you to push yourself and to be really rigid on this, to push yourself to add more time. If you think three minutes, then do five. If you think five minutes, do 10. And this is why I think this is so valuable. I've, I've done a lot of work around this and this is what's worked for me. Um, when I'm doing an exercise like this, and when I really hold myself and I set a, a, a little timer that counts down and I say, I'm not going to move, I'm not going to stop writing until the 10 minutes is up, I almost always find that the things that I come up with in the last minute or two minutes is really where the gold is. I, I know I, I use exercise and analogies a lot, but for those of you who lift weights, you know that where the strength comes from is the last one or two reps. It's when your arms are shaking, where you're having someone spot you, you're going to drop the weight. That is where the juice comes from. My belief is it's the same way in these writing exercises that if you force yourself to just continuously write without judgment, just, just get everything out on paper, even if it's nonsensical, when, you, when I look back on my notes in that way, I find that truth for me emerges in those final minutes. When I've exhausted the answers that are in my mind, I've exhausted the story that I'm telling myself. And instead, I've depleted things down to the area where I, I'm just 
letting my heart write. I'm letting my gut and my intuition drive these things. And I, I think I think that's very powerful for me. So I really wanted to to make sure that I shared that um, as part of this episode. And then the last piece is um, I believe personally that there is a power in sharing these things with trusted sources. And there is a power, I believe, in, in just speaking it out loud. And I also think that there's a power in, in with, with people we trust in hearing their response. And I'm not saying that their response is correct, but I think that we are often the worst judges of what is right. We can have some big blind spots. And so what I love to do in things like this is once I have clarity, so I've done my writing exercise, I've really stretched myself, I've written, and maybe I've revisited this multiple times. Well, then once I've got it narrowed down, I'm like, man, if I'm being honest, the things that really resonate on a physical and emotional level, not on a mental level, the things that really connect, the things that cause my heart to quiver, those are the things I'm going to share then with my wife, with my men's group, with my closest friends, with the people I trust. And what I'm looking for there is what resonates. What I'm looking for there is their honest assessment of like, man, you know, I hear you saying this, but that that doesn't really connect with me. But when you said this, man, something came through on that. When you said this, it really hit me. It seemed like you really believe that. It felt like that's something that's coming from your heart. And I think that it's, it's you know, those are the two things I really wanted to add. Extend the time, really force yourself to dig deep. In, in work settings, we, we used to do a lot of brainstorming exercise with sticky notes too. Same principle. We'd go for longer than is comfortable. Really deplete these ready answers and go to things that might be deeper or might be more outlandish or might be more unusual. Those were often where the insights came from from us from a business. And then having these soundboards, these advisors, mentors, close people to you to give you that feedback. I hope that helps. As always, special thanks to Steve Bain for coordinating this episode. Kathleen Dillon does our text transcripts. Michael Cummings does the artwork for our show. Um, Rick Healy does all of our social media work. Andrew Woolworths does our analytics. Thanks all to you who listen to support, uh, who support our show by giving your ears and feedback. Have a wonderful week, and I'll be back every Monday and Thursday with uh, interviews to help you in your civilian career and most Saturdays with just off-the-cuff remarks. Take care.